And this is where all this actually the where field theory started. So this was the first quantum field theory that was uh, constructed and understood. Uh, and where the Feynman rules were first formulated. So it describes interactions of electrons with electromagnetic fields, with photons. Um, and then, OK, it's clear that, uh, and we already know how to quantize free electromagnetic field and free uh, electrons We're using Dirac equation, <coughs> Manfold equation. Uh, and so now we need to formulate what are the Feynman rules. So we need to understand the propagators and the, see what is the interaction version. So the propagators are determined by uh, free fields, right? So the propagator is, uh, for instance, for photons. The propagator will be the time ordered product of two fields. Uh, and so these are built from oscillators in exactly the same way as for, so they, in the gauge that we have chosen, uh, the Coulomb gauge, they behave as four independent scalar fields. So the propagator will then uh, be equal to um, four independent uh, scalar propagators. And then photon has mass zero. So the in momentum space, the propagator is just minus i g mu divided by p square. Uh, yes? Sorry, you said this is equivalent to four, four independent oscillators. What precisely is equivalent to four independent oscillators? It's, uh, you can treat any a mu Within, I mean, <coughs> mu and index, index mu just labels four fields. So we can treat them as if they were just four independent scalar fields. Now, um, the truth is that the propagator will depend on the gauge. So the, if we have chosen the gauge in a different way, the propagator will be different. Uh, and Feynman rules will, will be different. So uh, the reason for that is that the field itself is not a gauge invariant observable quantity defined up to gauge transformations. Uh, and so the dependence on the gauge chosen will cancel in final answer for observable quantities. Uh, but uh, OK, uh, since, since this will happen anyway, we can pick up any gauge we want. So in the Coulomb gauge, the answer is particularly simple. And we will use it uh, throughout, uh, throughout the <coughs> course. Uh, so usually, the photon propagator is drawn as a wavy line. And now endpoints, they are characterized by, in the important presentation, by their positions, but also by the Lorentz indices. And in momentum space, we also need to specify the moment. Yes? Um, so, <coughs> um, so I have two questions. So first question, how is the uh, metric G mm -hmm. And also, um, I was thinking, so um, you 
animation now, you can, uh, if you have different gates, then uh, the topic is different. If, uh, so, okay. every time you fix the gate. Uh, so just to quantize the field, you need to fix the gauge. Otherwise, it's impossible. Okay. Um, so, so, is there any question? Well, uh, to, to write down the propagator, you need to quantize the field. You need to express it in, in terms of oscillators. And that would be different in, in different gauges. But from now, for now on, you don't need to think about it because, uh, well, you just pick this gauge for for now on and uh, uh, we can work in it and work out an expression in this particular gauge the answer is in any way independent on the gauge choice so concerning Jimmy new this is uh, well this is the first of all this is the only Lawrence environment expression that you can write and it appears here because the commutators of uh, the ladder operators uh, in A, so they commute on Gemini. Okay, so uh, this was uh, so we know how to um, write down the <coughs> propagator of photons. Uh, then. Uh, We need to, to understand the propagator of the Dirac field. Uh, and the, the Dirac field describes fermions. So for fermions, well, again, we can um, introduce the field as a vacuum expectation value of T or the product of two field operators. So this is uh, we take the as usual we take the t order product of two fields and that defines us the propagator. So for if you take two size, the result will be zero. Well, in, the formal reason for that is that uh, psi contains annihilation operators for electrons and creation operators for positrons, which commute with one another. So these fields commute, and so they will produce zero. The physical reason is that psi has charge one, and uh, so to, um, to have a non-zero expectation value, you have to insert, so the, the operator here should be the total charge is zero, so we have to have psi bar inside the in the in the matrix element. Uh, but then psi is a fermion, and for fermions, uh, one has to take into account the their anti-commuting nature. So the uh, the operators in, in this field stay anti-commute instead of commuting. So the time order product for fermions is also defined in a different way. Well, psi alpha of x, psi bar theta of y is defined to be psi alpha of psi bar theta. If x zero is larger than y zero, but if y0 is larger than x0, then we interchange their order, but also change the sign. Okay. 
So under the sign of time ordering, the operators anti-commute rather, rather than commute. So we take into account the statistics of the field. Um, and then uh, uh, we also need to calculate this matrix element to find the propagator. Uh, and uh, now the analogy with scalar fields is not is useless because the field behaves quite differently. So we need to calculate it anew. And uh, to do it, we can go through this uh, calculation of the Schwinger term. So we apply the direct operator to the propagator. <coughs> uh, so we can. Act by direct operator on S uh, of X minus Y. <coughs> so naively, this would be equal to zero when, because uh, the direct operator inflates the, the field. Uh, but uh, we'll pick a Schwinger term. So <coughs> let me omit the calculation. So the, the result is that. On the right hand side, we will get the delta function. So then we fully transform this equation. Um, so ID becomes the momentum. So the Fourier image of the Dirac field uh, satisfies this equation. So this is a matrix equation. Um, I don't write indices here, but it is understood that the Dirac operator is a matrix, <coughs> four by four matrix. S, as you see, is also a four by four matrix. And so uh, this, this is a matrix equation with the unit matrix on the right hand side. And so is the, this equation. So to find this, we need to invert. <coughs> we need to invert a four by four matrix. So S of P is equal to I times the inverse of the four by four matrix that has this form. <coughs> Unfortunately, there is a trick to do it. Namely, uh, we know that. Uh, P plus M with the slash times P minus M gives the Klein Gordon uh, expression P squared minus M squared uh, times the unit matrix. So we can then take the inverse of this <coughs> equation. Uh, this is a product of two matrices. The inverse of product of two matrices product of inverses taken in the uh, opposite order. And on the right hand side we have right. So then we multiply this equation by P plus M from the right. And so on the left hand side, we get what we wanted to compute. While on the right hand side, we get P plus M divided by P squared minus M squared. Therefore, the Dirac propagator is, uh, okay, let me write it in the coordinate space. So it's given by this expression. Uh, and usually it's depicted by a line with an arrow. So 
So the arrow here uh, denotes the flow of charge because now the field carries a charge. So uh, you see if we inserted field psi at point x, and uh, psi bar at point y, the convention is that we connect. Um, so the arrow uh, shows the direction from the psi to psi bar. And in principle, so there is also uh, a momentum arrow which can coincide with this arrow or be opposite. But then we need to take into account that uh, so P that stands here, so that the propagator is written here, corresponds to the arrow, these two arrows being in the same direction. Now the formulas for the <coughs> Green's functions and amplitudes are exactly the same. Yes? Sorry, to, to be clear, an arrow moving from x to y would correspond to an electron moving from x to y? So it's the arrows in the direction of negative curve? Right, but it also turns out that uh, positron moving from y yeah. to x corresponds to, I mean, it describes either electron moving from here to here or positron moving from there to here. So, um, uh, yes, oh, we also need to understand how to, uh, in the amplitude calculations, um, we need to understand how to, um, what to associate with external states. And before going to uh, before describing the external states, let me uh, just uh, show in simple examples what, how to work with, with propagators and what is the vertex. So the vertex just follows from the fact that the interaction Lagrangian in QED is minus I E A nu psi bar gamma psi. So, um, so what corresponds to this vertex? So we, we need to, um, <coughs> it will appear in the uh, exponent in, in the master formula. Uh, so, um, there will be three lines uh, uh, ending on this vertex, right? So there will be an electron line that comes in uh, because of, there is a psi bar. Then there will be another electron line moving out of it because there is a psi. And then there will be a photon line that uh, is emitted from this vertex. And uh, the vertex itself will contain, uh, will contain two elements. So um, let's see. Um, so there is no I here. Um, but there is an I, there is an I that appears in, uh, in the formula. So 
there will be an overall factor of minus e times minus i times e. And then there will be a gamma matrix that connects with the indices on psi bar and psi. Yes. Sorry, I hate to be that person, but are we still using the convention e is negative? Yes. All right. E is negative. That's a weird convention. But what helps is that in whatever expression you get, e always appears as a, in, in a square. Yes. <coughs> Diagram associated with the vertex contains three lines because the um, interaction term contains three fields. Exactly. Um, how it, is one of the lines associated with psi bar and the other associated with psi, or are two of the lines associated with psi bar, gamma mu, psi? Um, so the vertex itself uh, contains. <laughs> so in the Feynman rules, the vertex, so that there are, first of all, there are three indices in the diagram. Because we need to associate, so the endpoints of propagators now are associated with indices. And so the analytic expression that we should associate with this diagram is equal to minus i gamma mu uh, beta alpha. times e. <coughs> because psi bar was contracted with the gamma, psi bar and psi were contracted with the gamma. So then the synthesis remain on the propagators. And so this is, this is the vertex that we'll get from the Lagrange. So let's see how, how it all works. Yes. Um, so um, here you try to expand the uh, interaction of Lagrangian in terms of E. In terms of E, yes. So we are so expanding it. So when you are doing the correction, the always take the So you took a correction because of the Yes. We are expanding the Actually in this squared. So the but the it's uh, how how do you um sort of square one reasoning with the other I I thought we did say that What's important in the constant is the e squared, but here we're using just e. So how do we? That's right. So from Feynman rules, it will inspecting the Feynman rules. So I can see that only e squared appears. Um, there is a theorem called Fari theorem that proves that uh, no even powers of e can appear. No. No. No what power. Um, and it can be given a proof, uh, just diagrammatic proof. So let's see. Uh, first of all, uh, conventionally, uh, no one writes the Dirac indices. Usually they are suppressed because, as we will see, the, it's easy, easy to see how they are contracted. But the Lorentz indices are often, I mean, often one writes them explicitly. So for, for instance, let's um, compute correction to the uh, propagator. Um, and we will not, we'll only contract the Dirac fields and not worry much about the electromagnetic field. So let's compute correction, corrections to Fermi propagator. So this means that we have, um, we want to come, we have psi of x. 
uh, then we have psi bar y. <coughs> and then we insert uh, interaction vertices. So let's consider correction of second order. Um, so we insert two vertices uh, here. Um, so then we need to do um, weak contractions. So one contraction would look like that. So what we will get the, in the diagram language, so suppose that this is, um, okay, so the diagram that we will get will contain one uh, long uh, fermion line with the uh, photon lines emanating from it at some points. So the fact that the fermion line cannot get broken is just a charge conservation. So the charge can disappear. So this electron line it will continue through the whole diagram. Or the other possibility is that it makes a closed loop. And so when it makes a closed loop, uh, so, uh, well, let, let's see. Um, <coughs> Yeah, what is the analytic expression of this uh, diagram? So if the indices are mu and nu, uh, this will be equal to, uh, and so this, this is point x, y, z, and uh, w. So the analytic expression is, uh, well, we can just read the diagram from right to left along the electron line. So the first element will be the propagator S X minus Y. Uh, then we have an interaction vertex. So we have a gamma there. So then we have another propagator of from, sorry, this is <coughs> X minus Z. Z minus W, gamma nu, S, W minus Y. Uh, then A nu of Z contracted with the nu, A nu of W contracted with the nu. Um, and there will be a factor of uh, minus, let's see, minus I E squared. So another possibility is uh, that fermions make a closed loop, <coughs> and that one should be really accurate because um, in dealing with fermions, when we rearrange their order, we can pick up a minus sign. So for instance, let us consider <coughs> corrections to the photon propagator. Um, so that comes from two vertices uh, of this type. And so let's contract let's contract the fermion fields again. So suppose so there is there are, well let's see. Uh, there's just one way to do it, such that um, the psi's are contracted between the two between the two vertices. Um, so the claim is that uh, this is equal to minus um, so let's call it. 
So this is psi of x, psi of x. This is psi of y, psi of y. So this will be minus uh, psi of y, psi of x, um, psi of x, psi of y, and then two a's. So why so? So to, to write it this way, we need to pull this field, we need to anti-commute it three times. And so each time we anti-commute to size, we get the minus sign. So there will be an overall minus here. Yes? Out of curiosity, why is the, why is the other pairing like x to x and y to y? Why is that one invalid? Sorry? We, why is the pairing x to x and y to y invalid? Uh, it will be valid, but uh, well, if you look more carefully, you'll see that it's zero. But in principle, there is such pairing. We just want to study this one. I wanted to to um, give an example where we get a minus sign from anti-commutic fermions. So as a diagram, this looks like that. So we have a photon line, then we have a propagator from x to y, and from y to x. Uh, and so here, we have contraction of all fermion indices. So the index goes through <coughs> and uh, is contracted according to matrix multiplication. So the closed loop just means that we take the trace. Uh, so what we will get here is minus trace s of x minus y gamma mu s of y minus x gamma nu a mu of x a nu of y and we should also multiply by minus e minus i e squared Uh, you can write it, um, if you don't say it immediately, I suggest you to write it with indices, just after the lecture. Look how it looks with indices, and then you'll see that it's a term. But, um, So now, uh, um, external legs. So uh, if you study scattering of photons and electrons, uh, well, we need to know how to, what to associate it with external factors. So before, in the scalar theory, the factor was just one. Uh, now, in electrodynamics, it's a little bit more complicated. And this is because particles can appear in different spin states, right? So the scalar particle describes just one particular state. So it has no internal quantum numbers. Photons and electrons do have internal quantum numbers. They have spin. And uh, so we need to specify the <coughs> polarization of external state. So we can, for instance, study scattering of, um, I don't know, two linearly polarized waves in certain directions. And that we need to specify. Um, and so um, well, there is a long list of uh, external <laughs> factors that one can um, associate with um, 
with various uh, internal and external states. So for photons, it's uh, uh, more or less clear. So if you have a photon with polarization R, then its contraction with the field will uh, leave uh, the polarization vector. Remember that, polar that in the expansion of the field in oscillators, the oscillators multiply polarization vectors. So uh, when we take the contraction, this polarization vector will remain. So in momentum space, um, uh, Feynman rules, uh, the incoming photons will um, carry uh, uh, carry so we should multiply it by polarization vector. That depends on the momentum key. So uh, for again, so for the scalar we would have would have had a factor of one. Here we have a factor of uh, e um, with this polarization vector. Yes. I thought that earlier we said that we could treat a mu as four independent scalar fields. So that analogy of a mu to scalar fields does not hold you. Yeah, it doesn't carry over to ex <laughs> external states because external states should satisfy the extra condition that. Uh, they should be transverse polarized. So the um, expansion of the field in oscillators contains four type of oscillators. Two of them are unphysical. So they never appear in external states. And therefore, in the external state, we better have it is characterized. So the external state is characterized not by four numbers, but by two numbers. I mean, there are two degrees of freedom. The photon can have either positive or negative felicity, and that completely characterizes its state. Uh, so, so for, um, okay, so if you have a final state photon, um, <coughs> then the contraction gives epsilon r mu complex conjugate e to the i k x. So the outgoing photon uh, will be characterized by momentum and uh, polarization. And the factor that we should write here is epsilon nu r complex conjugate of k. Uh, okay, so we have electrons. So uh, um, so electrons. Okay, so the Dirac field describes electrons and positrons. So when we have an external particle then we should uh, uh, assign to it uh, charge and polarization. So we have spin up, spin down, and then we should tell whether it's electron or a positron. You had a question? Um, yeah, so I was going to ask what exactly the uh, star of a, of a polarization vector was. Is it just complex? Just complex conjugation. So. If we study circularly polarized waves with various with fixed helicity, then it's described by a complex vector. Oh, right. So, okay. Now, the field operator contains 
annihilation operators for electrons and creation operators for positrons. So uh, we so when acting on the uh, if state, psi can annihilate only electrons. So it describes um, an incoming electron and associates to it the wave function u s of p e, uh, alpha e to the i p x. So a factor associated to the external lamp will be u alpha s of p. Now, uh, or, so the same field operator can create, an create a positron. Uh, so meaning that <coughs> it can contract with a positron uh, in the final state. So that would give uh, Vs alpha of P times E to the minus, so that should be minus here, and plus here. Um, So this would correspond to correspond to outgoing uh, positron Now you see that um, outgoing positron is described by the line going inside the diagram. This is because our lines go from uh, so they are this this line describes the flow of charge in in the diagram, and so. Um, uh, in some sense, the same line describes positron going back in time, but that's, uh, yes. So for the charge label, positive represents an electron? Yes, plus corresponds to an electron. So that what corresponds to V S alpha of P. And then psi bar beta of X can contract with the positron in the initial state. That would be given by V bar theta uh, S theta of P. <coughs> and that would be represented by a line going out of the diagram. Uh, so the momentum here, uh, I guess, goes in the opposite direction. 
So this will be momentum p, and this will be this will have index beta here. <coughs> so finally, we have sidebar beta of x. Okay, so this represents the Feynman rules of QD. Now having these rules, we can compute, in principle, everything. So we can compute probability of um, any process. And, uh, well, uh, tomorrow we will do some um, simplest computations in QD uh, using these Feynman rules. Yes? Uh, the first one is e to the minus ideas, and the next one is e to the plus ideas, the same right? Yeah, so there should be some factors here. There should be, uh, <coughs> should be with the minus, there should be e to the ideas. So this is just the wave function of. This is the wave function of a, of a positron. And this is the conjugate of the wave function of electron. So the rule of the thumb is the following. So in the incoming lines, uh, we should associate the wave function to each external line. Uh, with even momentum. And for the outgoing, we should, uh, each line is, each outgoing line is associated with the conjugate of the wave function. Yes? Is the momentum there backwards? Here or there? The bottom. Oh, uh, I think it points uh, out of there. Yeah, so the momenta, here, they will point out, so the incoming momentum point inside the diagram without going particle, they point outside. Okay, let's finish here, thank you.